and hi, welcome to From the Research Chair. This is episode number 23. We're going to be talking about benchmarks. I'm Jason Voss, and that is Michael Falk. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, this is a subject in the pre-recording chatter. Uh, people were saying that we don't think that the industry talks about this subject enough. I shared a story that I was uh, giving a speech in Boston to an audience of investment pros, and I asked the audience, by a show of hands, who is comfortable with the style box and likes the style box, and or, or actually I said, who is uncomfortable with the style box? Nobody raised their hands. Uh, mm -hmm. Then I said, how many of you are afraid that your uh, clients and your consultants are in the audience? And everybody laughed. <laughs> and so I think that's that. Somewhere in between lies a comfortable conversation, maybe. Michael, why is this conversation of interest to us? We all live in a relative world. Can I just start there? So any of you people out there who think that there is such a thing as absolute return, stop it. All right? Because when I meet absolute return people, the first question I ask, absolute regarding what? I said, are we talking zero? Are we talking inflation? Are we talking a hurdle rate? Ah, so you really are a relative return investor. Mm -hmm. We just haven't codified the benchmark. <gasps> and there is the topic. We all live in a relative world. So because of that, we can benefit from good benchmarks to help us understand more about the decisions investors are making, about the quality of investments that sales marketing professionals are pitching, about what clients are seeing relative to their progress or progress for some of our fans in different countries towards their own personal investment goals. Mm. It's benchmarking useful to everybody yeah, when if it's I've, done well. Yeah, and I'll, I'll interject, like many of the subjects Michael and I choose to discuss on the From the Research Share podcast, uh, we are fans or supporters philosophically of things, critics of implementation. And I'm a big believer in benchmarking. We have to know if we're performing. Uh, I think where we disagree is where the industry has evolved to. I think in large part, based on the many conversations Michael and I have had over the years, um, Michael, before we sort of talk about what's the ideal benchmark, uh, do you want to talk about uh, the evolution or would you like me to take the evolution of things like the style box? Oh, well, you can start taking the evolution before I take the devolution of your evolution <laughs> and take it down to a deep, dark place of why it has become problematic. Understood. Well, so for those of you who haven't uh, read the co authored book I did with Tom Howard, uh, Return of the Active Manager, we actually have an extended discussion and research of the evolution of the style box. Uh, it, its origins really are from the early 1990s when anomalies started appearing in modern portfolio theory. That is, there were outsized returns and they were inexplicable relative to the theory. Um, and mm. FEMA and French in Chicago, I think it's around 92, if I'm not mistaken, they held an annual conference and they were starting to acknowledge that there were some holes in the strong form of uh, the market pipe, our modern portfolio theory and the strong market uh, version of efficient the market hypothesis. Thank you. The terms the you are version. looking for. Yeah, yeah, thank you. The strong version of the efficient market hypothesis. And at a conference, they noted two and spent quite a lot of time on two. One was the uh, not price to book, but book to price ratio. And the mm -hmm. other was a cap effect, meaning a small cap effect. I, I swear, and I've tried to track down via research, there must have been a Morningstar uh, professional in attendance this, at this event because not more than three months later, and I, have, I do have it on a chronology, I just, it's all circumstantial. They came out with the style box, which of course had um, a version of price to book and market cap on two axes, kind of a clever idea. And it was meant to explain how is it, given that these are the two anomalies we're accepting and the theorists are accepting, somebody's delivering additional bang for the buck, if you will. Um, and where it's gone from there, I think is a horrible Frankenstein's monster. But <laughs> Michael, please weigh in. 
Well, it started off as a, I will say, useful concept. And it was with good intention. Meaning, it wasn't about what it was as much as how it was used. And when we want to compare manager A to manager B, let's keep it very innocent here, okay? We can't compare them unless how they're investing is quite similar. It's really as simple as that. So to say that manager A is better than manager B, and let's say manager A invests primarily in stocks, manager B invests primarily in bonds, this is a silly comparison, we might say, but that's benchmarking. Benchmarking is comparing one to another or one to a group. And the concept started off very strong. The problem is what happens when you give a measuring stick to a bunch of really intelligent people? They find a way to game the damn stick and you want to beat the people in your style box? Maybe invest a little outside of those crisp, clear lines. Yeah. And if you invest outside of those lines and that was a good idea, you look at least six inches taller than yeah. everybody else in your box. That's right. So, I'm going to jump in. I, I've got problems, I mean, with the style box. And I, I think just how it was framed and created was done, I don't think, with a lot of thought, right? But it took off as a concept very rapidly. I remember um, early days of my investment management career, which were basically coincident with the evolution and the emergence of the style box. And it exploded, right? It was it was instantaneously sort of on the tips of the tongues of many in our business. My primary problem is just methodologically, you've got price on both axes. And so consequently, you are giving a lot of uh, outsized influence on the style having to do with something completely outside of the manager's control, which is what the market does. Managers don't really have control over that. And so what that means is over time, if you're a buy and hold uh, strategy, you're definitely gonna have style drift having nothing to do with any of your choices um, and so that methodologically, you've got a problem. Can I, let me translate for Jason. Sometimes he needs a translator. Do it. Uh, if you only buy small cap value stocks and you are the most brilliant of investors, over time, they are going to migrate to mid cap blend. I'm using Morningstar's box now to right. large cap blend or large cap growth. If you are buying correctly, all of your picks are not going to stay in the style in which you purchased them. You now, still, the industry ahead. now for benchmarking frowns upon that drift, drift bad. Oh, don't go really? that far. Don't go that far yet to all the way to style drift and tracking here. We, we still have methodological. Stuff. Sorry, sorry. I was, <laughs> I was rolling. Anyway, well, yeah. this is the point. When you do really good work, or let's say contrary, you're a large cap investor, and you're really bad at the job, and your stocks continue to lose money, you look like a mid-cap manager. Yep. Yeah. How do we benchmark you? Yeah, so the, the other part of the methodology that uh, is uh, at issue for me is that Morningstar artificially creates thirds in this chart, right? So that means, they're trying to keep the size of these this box relatively the same. If you actually animate it, where you hold, if you look at low turnover managers, an interesting case study, and I actually built the presentation uh, one time that contained this. I found a manager that had like 0% turnover or near zero for like three year period of time. And I so I held their holdings fixed, right? And I showed how, their, how they moved around the style box. It was the style box that was moving, not them because they had no turnover. So they were, they could be more perfect, but yet the box moved around. That's, that's- Well, and, and Jason, you raise a really interesting point. They created a nice tic-tac-toe chart. But if you look at the actual market in terms of price level and capitalization, you look at those two dimensions, 
It's not equal. They're forcing it to be equal. There is not an even column set or an even uh, row set. It doesn't look that way. I, the simplest way I'll give you cap is over 70% large cap in the market. And they make the rows equal. It's under 10% small cap. So small cap rows as big as the large cap row? Mm. If, if they were to redraw this thing to scale, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how interesting would that be of an illustration over time to show where the weight of attention is of investors? Oh, that'd be another cool animation. Put that sucker up and show how the box kind of morphs and it, it goes from square to weird polygon that only mathematics could describe. Um, so another uh, issue, um, actually half a step back, existentially, I think the idea makes sense, right? We're trying yeah, to it's explain, good idea. We're trying to explain how people add value, but then we come to our next methodological issue. There are lots of ways to add alpha besides your cap choice and your valuation choice. Um, we've discussed quite a few of them on the podcast here. So that's another problem is you have a two-dimensional graph that because it took off and it became a marketing sensation, we're stuck with this 30-year-old methodology. Um, so that's another, another problem. Now, Michael, we can get to style drift and tracking error, um, which when those became consultant uh, preferred measures of, of how to track managers. And you, you raised earlier, Michael, an interesting problem. What if managers cheat? Like I, I actually was a consultant at one time, almost 30 years ago. And we saw a manager who looked really terrible for a couple of years and then really good. And all the returns were, and alpha calculations were relative to the benchmark. And in little tiny print was, we switched our benchmark from the S&P 500 to the Dow Jones. And of course the Dow had underperformed the S&P for the period that they had selected. So there is something to be said there. What's your style? What is your benchmark? And holding people to that. At the end of the day, you love baseball metaphors. I know, uh, Michael, if Babe Ruth points to the right field fence and says that's where the home run is going and he hits it there, you would go, oh, they said they were going to do A and they did A. Well, check. And that's really the concept here. And I agree with. So anyway, style drift tracking. So we're actually about. not sure if he act, if he called his, his shot. I know. I know. It's, because it's, where he was pointing is up for debate. It's anyway, we digress for a moment. I know. Yeah, so funny. the old bumper sticker. Drift happens. <laughs> How about a proper bumper sticker? Drift should happen. Mm -hmm. You buy small and you're good. You're not going to end up owning small caps. Mm -hmm. You buy large and you're bad. You're not going to end up owning large caps. Mm -hmm. Drift should happen based upon your skill level. So, why are we not going back, Jason, to your point, saying, what is it that you're doing? Let's understand your philosophy and your process, again, for our overseas friends. Let's understand and understand how you're executing on your philosophy with your processes. I can go deeper, but I'll leave it at just those two, philosophy and process. Yeah, because that will be our, our bullet point four when we put forth a, a better idea for benchmark, which I think is truly exciting. Better benchmarking. I, I wish we'd thought of it. It's so good. <laughs> it is. It's really quite wonderful. And some of you have been around as long as we have, and you will recognize it when we talk about it. Yeah. So next topic, benchmark tail wags the PM dog. So I, I think the ultimate problem with benchmarks and style box as they evolved is that they ceased to be performance measures after the fact and became performance targets before the fact. And there are enforcement mechanisms for making sure that you tow the line. When you couple that with other things like fees being really important to the discussion, you have managers who may have uh, forced turnover just so that they can adhere to their style, which then drives more fees, which then they get punished for as well. So we have this flawed measure, which has come to dominate or did for a long period of time, dominate the discussion around whether manager was, I don't know, being honest. I, I don't know how else to put it. Oh, this, what a pet peeve. You know, you, on prior podcasts, we've talked a little bit about the cell discipline. So let me just 
echo back to that. Let your winners run. Mm -hmm. If you have anything but a large cap equity style boss, box, letting your winners run makes you look like you've done something illegal hmm. according to your agreement, your contract. Mm -hmm. And people are constantly trimming their winners so they look like they're still playing fairly. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're sacrificing performance. By the, by the way, your clients usually don't chastise you for adding performance. We're sacrificing performance in the name of style consistency. Can we just rephrase that word consistency? Style stupidity? <laughs> I mean, I love it. People back in the day wanted to have a, have a fund manager in every one of the nine boxes. Congratulations, you created a hyper expensive index fund or one that's going to correlate massively to the total market index. You don't need to fill all the boxes. You don't need to fill half the boxes. Yeah. And here's a, here are a couple more problems. One, that's not the prize. The prize is at the measure at the client level. Is the client achieving her or his goals? Not whether or not um, a manager did what relative to the style box. That's that's a BS measure, to be perfectly blunt about it. You um, just spoke a four-letter word, Jason, without realizing. You spoke the word risk. <laughs> you want, a, you want a, a useful definition of risk? Our industry just would hate this. And see Good. our other podcasts on this subject. Yeah. Our useful, a useful definition of risk is a client not reaching their goals. That's the only one we should care about to be- The only honest. one. So the, the next big issue with uh, what's happened, and we've put, we've laid blame at the consultant community, Morningstar, Lipper was a part of, and part and parcel of this, this game for a while too. Let's look at our fund management uh, peers, meaning the, the actual portfolio managers as well. Way back in the day when we set up our business model, we didn't do so very thoughtfully because we didn't imagine uh, index funds as a competitor. We set it up as a percentage of the assets we manage. Oops, we've set up a commodity pricing on what should be a luxury good. Um, active management delivering alpha is a luxury good, but it's priced basically um, on the pile of assets, the size of the pile of assets, essentially communicating to the market that the only thing that matters is either your expense ratio or the size of the pile you manage. And nobody chooses investments that way. They just don't. So we've got a mismatch. That's a great business model if you're an uh, asset agglomerator. If you're an asset earner, meaning you're actually earning returns, it's a terrible business model. And what that means is if you start to get punished by some of these measures and your business model is to agglomerate assets and you start to see assets bleed out the door because Morningstar has dinged you because you've got style drift or tracking error, well, then you're going to toe the line because it's better to fail conventionally than unconventionally. And so we then succeed minted. unconventionally. Exactly. And so we have minted, I think unintentionally, none of us wanted to end up here. We've minted a whole industry that A, doesn't serve client goals, two, it doesn't have clients front and center, duh, and two, has created the recipe for, I think, closet indexing, which is, mm -hmm. you know, dominates, depending on the measure, 70% of assets in our management are thought to be closet indexers. Ouch. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, and when you rethink that, expense ratio, Jason, based upon only the unindexed amount or un, what's the term now, active share amount. Wow, does it look expensive if you are starting to look a little index-like. Recharacterizing your fee based upon your active management amount within your portfolio. That's a benchmarking issue. Folks, the point we wanted to make, it's all about benchmarking one way or another. We cannot escape this. So if we can't escape it, we need to start doing it better. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we need to, I think the proposal that we're going to have, again, not our suggestion, it's brilliant, never took caught fire. Oh, I don't want to give away too much. But we, we think no. there's a brilliant opportunity for this to get well, much better. I, I got to jump to Shark. For just, let me jump to Shark for just a moment. I have okay. a good friend who's in the endowment space. Mm-hmm. And we've been having an ongoing wonderful debate about endowments failing or succeeding mm-hmm. versus you could have just bought an S&P index and you would have had much better performance than almost any endowment in the land mm. or pension fund for that matter, because they went into hedges and PE and infrastructure. And it's been an incredible 10 years for the S&P 500. So his, I say, maybe the endowment model, not so good. And he says, wait a minute. Nothing like using the last 10 years as your benchmark. Hmm. I said, is 10 years not long enough? Oh, he didn't like that. He, Hmm. I said, you want to go back 20 years? Well, let's, let's look at the tail of the tape for 20 years. Still doesn't look so good for you. He said, what's the right benchmark? I said, where could you have invested your money? He goes, what do you mean? I said, you've got free reign. You're an asset owner. Where could you have invested your money? You can't say the S&P is not a good benchmark. You could have put all your money in the S&P. You didn't have to spread it around. So when we start talking about benchmarks, don't we have to, Jason, somehow talk about the opportunity set? We do Where could to. you have put your money? Yeah, we're not quite there yet. We've got one more. I time. know. I'm just edging. I'm just edging. Oh, we're so we have to, to talk, talk about, about where you could have put your money in the first place. Oh, sure. I I, I liken the situation that we're, we're in to, uh, forgive the sports uh, analogy, that somebody does an at-bat and they are focused on their batting average, not scoring runs. And they lose sight. And I don't think real batters... Some batters may get up there and do that, but the ones that succeed long-term as batters have uh, on their mind, I have to help the team score runs as opposed to what the batting average is. So that's that's ultimately the problem is batting average is a measurement after the fact, after the at-bat. So is slugging percentage, so is on-base percentage. All those things are measurements after the fact, not before the fact. And if you get the two reversed, you got a problem because it creates bad incentives. Michael, any closing comments on benchmark tail wags the uh, portfolio management dog? No, I think we uh, we beat the dog a little too much, maybe. <laughs> the dog wants to run away. Um, so next thing uh, that we swore we would talk about, passive management is not passive. No. Michael, I know this is a passionate, dare I say it, topic of yours. There is a committee that decides what goes into the benchmark, or there is an algorithm that decides what goes into the benchmark. By the way, a committee designed the algorithm. So there's always a committee back in there somewhere. We may have to go one or two or three steps back. Once there are people involved, that means active decisions were made. That's step one. Step two, over time, sometimes those decisions change. Sometimes the benchmark loses or gains a security. Sometimes a person has to actively choose to use that index fund in their portfolio. Sometimes even if that that person chooses to use that index fund in their portfolio, sometimes they have to choose whether or not to rebalance the fund. Passive, all of my friends listening, is the most brilliant marketing scheme to make (laughs) indexation sound stupid, dumb, and useless that was ever invented. It's just indexing, and there is nothing passive about it. Somewhere in the chain of of developing the index or using the index, there is active behavior. Hmm. Which there are two things there that are suggested. One, maybe we should look at the criteria because they're badass, right? 
Mm-hmm. And I, I'm going to get there in just a second. The other thing uh, that- You that, mean the criteria to build the index? Well, for example, the S&P 500 uh, is put together by the US index community at S&P Dow Jones Indices. And they have a number of criteria that they they use. Uh, since we're on the subject, I'll just it's like them. a philosoph. It's like a philosophy from an investment manager, isn't it, Jason? It it absolutely is. How do they choose these criteria? So let's just take some of these and see if these are things that we do as active managers as well. First, of course, is market cap. Market cap is kind of a proxy for longevity of the firm, quality of the firm, for example, especially with the more large cap issues. Where a manager chooses to fish. Yeah. Liquidity is one of the key issues. Liquidity turns out to be something that you do want as an active manager as well. Specifically, if you have a lot of AUM, liquidity matters. Yes. Domicile is their third criteria that they list. And we all know that the U.S. has had outsized economic performance post-World War II, mostly due to geopolitics, but we won't go there. Um, In any case, um, then float. Eh, That one's probably not that interesting. Well, well, Uh, no, no, that's another liquidity topic. Well, sure, sure. But I mean, not interesting because we already hit liquidity. Um, Next is sector. So they have a balance of sectors. So meaning that the S&P 500 captures as a proxy economic activity within a particular domicile of the US, probably smart, probably wise to diversify in that way. Uh, They looked at the financial viability, whatever that means. I'm guessing many of you do that same thing. That sounds like that term quality that we hear all the time, Jason. Exactly, and the index components don't change very frequently, meaning it's very low turnover. Sounds like a good strategy to manage money. I think it probably does. So there's your active philosophy uh, that is present in the S&P 500. But I will point out the index frequently gets a free pass on many of the measures. Like the trainer ratio is hideous because it uses as the denominator beta and the index gets a one, meaning all of its return is kept. If you're a manager and you're greater than one, you have it somewhat debited because of it. Well, that's ridiculous. That doesn't make any sense. There's clearly risk in the index too. See down years. Exhibit A, 2008. So, yeah, Exhibit B, 2000, uh, 1999 through 2002. Uh, Michael, what, what else What else do you want to say about the indexes? I got one other thing that I wanted to share. They're not your enemy, but for they will eat your lunch if you don't start producing. What you need to do is do some of the things that it does really well, not just the things that Jason talked about. Well, one of them, that low turnover thing. Do you know this this nasty little thing that we talk about in the industry called survivorship bias? Do you know how much it helps an index fund over time? But active managers don't allow it to help because they trim their winners. An index fund does not. Losers become a much, much smaller part of the portfolio in an index fund. In active managers, they get topped off because people continuously add to their losers. Maybe just blow it out. (gasps) Again, from our cell discipline podcast. So there are behaviors that are automatic, programmatic in an index fund that active managers can adopt but they willfully choose not to adopt them, even to any extent. And that is hamstringing their performance versus an index. The other, the other thing you didn't hit on that note, buy and hold, like really buy and hold, really low turnover, in addition to reducing expenses, is going to minimize behavioral bias. It's going to minimize taxation of gains, too. There are all kinds of things that are embedded in just hanging on. Um, there's other stuff. Um, see articles that we've written um, rather than torturing you all. Um, so at long last, what is our vote, Michael, for, and it's one of the, I, I have to interject something. Michael, you and I, too bad we didn't discover uh, one another sooner in our careers. We are brothers of a different mother. Uh, yeah, half brothers. I don't know what how else to describe it. Like when he and I will you talk about the hair about, side, uh, let's so, just let's so far, just. you are so far, you are older than I am. 
So not a lot. <laughs> How did you look when you were my age? Whole nother digression. Um, anyway, Michael and I very frequently will be having a discussion at random that just pops up and we have covered and tread the same ground and came to similar conclusions. This is one such example. And might we absolutely emphasize the import of what we're about to share with you. Michael, what is the best thing that you and I have discovered in terms of benchmarking? Opportunity set. So I mentioned it before. This can be done with an index fund. This can be done within your philosophy. This can be done even if you're an endowment. Ouch, it's a little more painful then. But opportunity set. What are you pursuing for consideration to invest in? If you have a, let's make this a fishing pond, all right? If your philosophy says your fishing pond has 500 securities, like the S&P 500, or your fishing pond has 132 securities, it's all good, doesn't matter. You design your pond and you may have different methodologies for how and why. Once you design that pond, that's your opportunity set. Now we could reflect on the design of that opportunity set versus the market entire, but that might be a little more painful. Let, why don't we start with that 132? And you tell us, listen, our target is to invest in just 30 names. We're more concentrated. Mm -hmm. Tell me, mathematically, how many different 30 name portfolios could have been created out of the 132 fish? And over the time horizon that you have said is your time horizon. Now we have created a what what a gentleman that Jason's going to give his his name in a moment. We both have great appreciation. You will now have created a synthetic peer group. All of the thirty names out of the one hundred and thirty two, you will get a distribution. They're all equally weighted portfolios, folks. Don't get too unbelievably nutty here. They're all equally weighted portfolios you will get a distribution from high to low of the results across this synthetic peer group. This is your philosophy's benchmark, period. End of story. No gaming. Now, you can then go further and say, how does our 132 stack up against the S&P 500? Or because, the Russell now you can use, because now you can objectively, finally measure the performance of the index two. Correct. How many 132 security portfolios could have been created out of the 500 or the 3000? Whatever the master index is in this case, you can measure and get benchmark feedback on your philosophy. You can measure and get better benchmark feedback on your portfolio. Jason, the gentleman that we have great appreciation for, his name is... Ron Surz, S-U-R-Z. And poor Ron languished in obscurity and still sort of languishes in obscurity. Came up with this idea, I think like 16, 17 years ago. Oh my promoted God, it. I think it's older than that. Yeah, he promoted it widely. Never took off. Uh, but still, I think the best idea... Michael, the only detail that you left out there was uh, the median of those portfolios, if you perform better than that, then you can say with certainty that you've got skill. The median within the synthetic peer group. Of course. Yeah, yeah. just let's just add that. Yeah. So how are you benchmarking? Are you using a tool like this where you can measure your philosophy or you can measure your success within your philosophy? These are good things if your team is all about continuous improvement. Hmm. And if you now have apples to apples comparisons that you can make. You now are not constrained with Starbucks's two ways of adding value. Hello? I mean, I, I former active manager, thought I added active uh, alpha in lots of different ways, not just based on what the description, description was from a style box. Now, based on how that fishing pond is established, I have a way of looking at all the factors that contributed. And this same synthetic peer group can be done across asset classes. 
you can actually do that because it's an equal weighting within the synthetic peer group. So if you are an endowment fund and you have a choice, we can do VC, we can do PE, we can do infrastructure, we can do hedge fund, we can do, you can put it all into the fishing pond. It's a little bit tougher to construct, yes, but you can do this. And then of course, as we've talked about, you can compare the pond to the ocean, or you can compare your portfolio to your pond. And now we have a way of doing what Babe Ruth may or may not have done when pointing at the right field fence, which is we should evaluate managers based on what they say they're going to do. And by the way, one of the things we didn't hit with the benchmarks that is, is a crusher is that if we are active managers, by definition, we're saying that we believe in human potential and human creativity. And that gets crushed when we're sort of shoehorned into the bland sameness that is an index. Now we have a way with the pods, portfolio opportunity distribution sets of unleashing that because we can now measure the contribution of those different elements of creativity and super powerful. One, one comment, I, I, I missed a point earlier and it's one of my favorite analogies I gotta share with you, forgive me, Michael, where we rewind slightly to the benchmark thing. I, we have a story in Return of the Active Manager uh, about the benefits of, imagine if you're a sprinter, your job is to win the race, right? But imagine if somebody came to you and said, hey, we're gonna include you on the US Olympic track team, which has kind of happened just recently. Uh, and we're looking at Usain Bolt as the benchmark and we need somebody who is Usain Bolt's height, weight, uh, we need your uh, body fat uh, ratio to be identical. And heck, the closer your genetics are to Usain's, the better. Um, we're not sure to the degree that you know him eating food in Jamaica matters, so we'd like you to eat Jamaican food. We've measured with precision to the 10,000th of a degree, his body lean as he escapes out of the blocks, et cetera, et cetera. Could we get that person? And that's basically benchmarking. The problem is there's only one Usain Bolt. And no sprinter in the world is going to win trying to do what Usain Bolt does, they're going to win by doing what they can do best given their body type. This is also pods. If my body type is A and I'm stuck with it and my habits are what I'm stuck with, et cetera, et cetera, the best I can do ought to be my personal benchmark, not Usain Bolt. Maybe you're not a sprinter because you're a little bit more of a robust person. Maybe you're a wrestler. This is the simplicity that we want to try and share these concepts with you. Please excuse the uh, sports metaphors and usage of the, those pictures or those details. The bottom line is, is your benchmark fitted to what you are doing? If it is not, the measurement is useless. Now, then, now we get to the interesting question of, how are your clients seeing you? Thank you for coming back to clients. I was going to go. Well, it's just a matter of time. How are your clients? If your clients are hiring you to beat the S&P 500 and your skill that you have documented, measured, and understand is not in large cap U.S. stocks, you shouldn't take the money. You will get fired. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of time. Well, it depends so on the, the question is, does your client understand what you do? Are that they hiring you because of what you do, not to fill something in their portfolio? I'm, the only pushback I'll give is, I think you stated that a little too strongly. If I'm a client and I will be happy if you beat the S&P 500 and I say, do that however you, you can, but don't use leverage, that might be my one, you know. Well, that's okay. Stock, right? Yeah, and if you beat the S&P 500 by investing in small cap stocks or bonds or whatever you're investing in, if that's what I want, who cares? Um, so, but that puts the client back in the equation. I, fair, I want you to pull that's that out. a fair pushback. Yeah. But we, we do know that when you start investing in a different asset class versus the one they're asking you to beat, then you are a bit more dependent 
upon the beta of that asset class for the period of time that you will be managing the money. Is the wind behind your sail or is the wind in your face? So there's you're still taking on a challenge of accepting money that you may not keep for a long period of time. Michael, I'm I think it's about time for questions. Do you have any final remarks before we turn it over to QA? I'll just circle back to the comment I opened up with. Folks, we live in a relative world. Stop trying to make it something else. Mm. And if you want to understand where you stand, where someone else stands, that's all about benchmarking and doing it accurately will give you good feedback. Doing it any other way than accurately, the feedback is valueless. Mm. Now, questions. I'll, 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 since you did that, there's one thing I want to reemphasize too. Sorry. And then QA, sorry. I'll, I'll be quicker, I think. Um, it, it's good to be the benchmark. It's good to be Usain Bolt if everybody's trying to be Usain Bolt. It's good to be uh, the king, Mel Brooks. It is good to be the king. Don't lose sight of the fact you're trying to win the race. You're trying to score runs. Not, you're not playing for batting average. Q&A, mm. any questions, comments, problems, hassles, pushbacks, complaints? Yeah, it's all good. It's all feedback. Yeah. I have one. Um, hello, Tom. Hello, guys. How are you doing? Doing good. well. How are you today? How are you? I'm fine. Um, so why, uh, two parts, why hasn't pods gotten traction? And secondly, are you aware of organizations that have adopted it and how have they used it? Uh, first part, why did it not get adopted or was it why? I think the competitive environment of the Morningstar style box about the same time was so strong, he couldn't surpass it as one individual doing 100% of the marketing. Uh, it's really amazing how few consultants actually know about it, Tom, to be candid. Uh, I think it was just his marketing during a period of time of sheer style box domination. Second part, I'll let Jason respond to both if he wishes. Second part, uh, managers that Jason and I have done work with, some of them have started to use pods as an internal measure for themselves regarding their work after learning about it from us. Yeah, and Tom, I'll, I'll take that second part first. Uh, the only ones I'm aware of that are doing it are using it internally as a feedback mechanism so that they can get better. But the fact that they're only using internally is suggestive of the answer to the first point. Uh, in answer to that question, I think there are a number of factors. I think industry inertia is gigantic. We have this colossus of trillions of dollars in assets under management all signed up for for the most part, with a very few exceptions, the same business model, which is the bigger your pile of assets, the more money you make. And we've all bought into and systematized through consultants and the way endowments ask questions, the way boards have been educated and the way the CFA program goes and the way MBA programs are taught that this is how it's done. So to overcome that is a colossal endeavor. Mm -hmm. um, and not that you suggested, Tom, but I, I'm I'm going to, maybe somebody in the audience is thinking this, but another possible objection, which is, I think some people use the default mental model of somehow great ideas always find the light. I, I beg to differ. I've used plenty of technologies uh, as a portfolio manager, and I haven't managed money since 2005, uh, that, that were superior to what I see in the marketplace today, but they're gone. They're not available any longer. And the reason they're gone is the businesses that operated the data service of the data analytics service went out of business for want of customers. So you can't send another way. Marketing is important. And I would say Ron just, he didn't, he didn't succeed in his marketing efforts, but the idea lives on. Um, it's still, I think the only real way of benchmarking that makes sense. And I, I hard person to think of a better way to do it. I think he kind of has a tautology, meaning a complete, complete idea that ought to be used. The mental model, Jason, you meant to mention the mental model, Tom, I'll add one more thing. People want a universal benchmark for ease so they can compare many, many, many managers all at once. So the convenience factor, you know, for those of us of a certain age, 
Betamax was better than VHS. VHS was an easier technology. Um, using an index fund as a benchmark, using a peer group as a benchmark is just easier. But as we know, an off the rack piece of clothing versus one that is custom fitted to you, there's a difference. Yeah, and if it, what we're saying is that the off the rack is priced the same as, or as the bespoke, or rather the bespoke is priced the same as off the rack, which is dumb. But anyway, that, so that's- let me, let me just follow up one-, one Please, thing. please, please come. Um, so the Michael's endowment friend that he has a discussion with, um, Usually there's a cocktail involved, Tom, just to, <laughs> just to be clear. I, I think that that was probably understood, but um, he, he can or she can uh, take advantage of this in a sense uh, by picking their spots, by using a more sophisticated benchmarking tool to build aggregate portfolios rather than, right? And rather than comparing one-on-one -on -one versus a similar benchmark across. Is, is that a fair statement or how do you think about that? I, I think it is a fair statement. It just goes back to, listen, when you're an asset owner, you've got real privilege. You can invest in almost anything you want. You've got the reputation, you've got the depth of talent or access to talent, you've got the long duration. You can really invest in anything you want. That doesn't mean you should invest everywhere, but that's real privilege. Be careful how you use it. And the more knowledgeable you can be about using that privilege, the better off I think you'll be in the long run. Any other, I don't have anything to add to that. Any, uh, John? Yeah, well, here's a idea or two on uh, our work with uh, benchmarking. Uh, first idea is every, Almost every client our firm's ever served um, has um, fussed and moaned because uh, we didn't beat uh, the S&P 500. And our response has been uh, twofold. One, asset, asset allocation done right means always having to say you're sorry. <laughs> I got a more entertaining version of that. A oh diversified dear. more portfolio always guarantees you have a dog in your portfolio. An undiversified portfolio could give you an entire kennel. <laughs> or a dead dog. That's, or, de or a lot of dead no, dogs. No dead dogs. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, we would, uh, in all sincerity, respond that in order for us to give you the performance of the S&P 500, and we, we're glad to, but you'd have to answer your risk questionnaire differently before we'd let you have it and they're not willing to do that. The S&P 500 is always in flashing lights. Um, it's on the news, the nightly news often. It's, it's, it's inevitable and it's, you know, um, we've uh, in the last two years uh, started using uh, the Morningstar Lifetime Allocation Index. And so if somebody is uh, uh, moderate um, and they retired in 2015, then we do our best to cobble together a benchmark that mirrors uh, the Morningstar Lifetime Index um, moderate 2015 portfolio. And that works until you know, one part of it gets too big and then it, like you say, moves, morphs into another box. Um, I had another question I was gonna ask you, but it just escaped my mind. I'll go on to somebody else and let's see if it comes back. Well, let me ask a philosophical question to our, our audience members. Rebalancing. Yeah, that's it. Uh, do you need to change your benchmark or can you keep the same one? <laughs> Ooh, rebalancing. If you rebalance or if you don't rebalance, can you keep the same benchmark? I think if you don't rebalance, um, it'd be good to explain to my client uh, why um, 
we didn't switch the benchmark because, um, you know, if all of a sudden commodities go to 50% of the portfolio because of some stroke of uh, thing you can't explain and the rest and large cap goes to 5% and you didn't uh, change your benchmark, um, someone will say, well, you're dishonest. Well, the functional uh, equivalent to that nasty little question I tossed out there is if a tree falls in the forest and nobody's there to hear it, does it make a sound? Mm -hmm. Be very careful. As I've often said, there is an art to benchmarking and you ought to learn it because it's really important with clients. With clients, simply the goal. Say, stop looking at the S&P 500. You don't want to retire to the S&P 500. You want to retire to a lake house with a boat. <laughs> so that's not the S&P 500. That's a lake house with a boat. Yeah. Always the goal. Bring them back to the goal. And it may be a funded ratio on a pension fund. It may be that lake house for a mom and pop. Different for different people. That's okay. The goal is the ultimate benchmark. Are you making progress to that goal? Are you doing it in fits and starts or are you doing it more on a peaceful, even path? The more right. peaceful, even path you make progress with, the less agitation the client will experience and you will receive. Mm -hmm. So, Michael, I, I totally agree with you, but uh -oh. I, I, I find, yeah, exactly. There's always a but, right? <laughs> no, so, I just feel bad for you right now. <laughs> <laughs> I love the pods idea, but, but how does that connect to the client's objective? If the client's objective is your, is your lake house, what, what, what possible use is the pods idea? Mm. What, where the pods idea can come into play there, this is a little twist, Simon. And it, it's a little contortional type of twist. So don't get too excited. Get on with it. Come on. <laughs> that path. So let's, let's pretend uh, you are here now and their goal is, we'll just make that a smiley face. I published an article on this, by the way. Um, we can share the link later. The smiley face is somewhere out in time, years from now, with a higher AUM level so that you can finance your goal. You can fund it. There is a line that connects you are here to that goal. We'll call that line required rate of return based upon how much savings you have, the cost of the goal, how much you're willing and able to save over the next 30 years, right? That's the required rate of return. Your path towards that goal is going to be above and below that required rate of return over time. The real question, Simon, is to begin with, that required rate of return, is it achievable or is it fantasy land? If it's fantasy land, then you have to coach them about this is not achievable. We have to rethink your goal or the time period or all of the above. If it is achievable, you know what the funny little thing here is? The average client wants you to achieve it with the least risk possible. They're not looking to supersize the lake house. They just want the damn lake house. Mm -hmm. So it helps. So pods doesn't apply as much when you get to mom and pop, but there is a question about pods across asset classes. What is a lower volatile, more peaceful portfolio that will still get them there? See, I'm going to answer slightly differently. Um, even though some of you didn't ask me the question, I, I think pods and how you talk to a client about benchmarking depends on the client, right? Some clients just don't care, but if they're a more sophisticated client, you actually now have a way of talking about the contributors to performance besides, and you can start to illustrate it as well as if you're an advisor who chooses funds, you now have a way of actually identifying funds a priori, ex ante, who actually perform well because you may have done your own due diligence using pods as a framework and concept. So you can identify the key factors that contribute to performance over the long run. Um, Tom, 
Howard and I, for Return of the Active Manager, did some of that. We, we identified four factors, which we've talked about on the podcast before, that are predictive of future returns. So pods isn't just about the benchmarking. It also then can be used to do your due diligence work and have even more in-depth conversations. Um, yeah, it's pods. more for due diligence for individual managers. It can be used for portfolios, but it's a higher degree of difficulty. Simon, just to go back to one more point about my required rate of return line. Over time, people are going to be making progress that's better than that or worse than that. When their progress is ahead of their pace, they have choices to make. When do we save a little less? Do we take a little risk out of the portfolio? Meaning, do we we little less equity commonly? Okay. Or do we do nothing? When they're behind the pace, they have another set of questions. This is the article I wrote. Another, do I actually top off my savings? Do I change my goal a little bit? Do I take a little bit more risk within the portfolio? These are actually the most powerful questions that need to be answered along the journey to the lake house. I hope that helps. Jason, if you're able, can you put in the chat uh, the link to the article that I published in December last year? What I will do is I'll put it on YouTube because we only have two minutes left and it would be a mad scramble with the remaining two minutes. Fair, because you can use your fingers better than I can. <laughs> it still would be a bad Thanks. scramble. <laughs> um, the, the other thing I'll, I'll add about pods, I, I think the industry, first of all, I don't think the industry will adopt pods, I, but I also don't think the industry is going to survive in its current form for long. There will be mm-hmm. closet indexing asset agglomerators who will consolidate like mad and hope like hell. Nobody pays attention to how bad their performance and how expensive their performance is. And then there'll be active managers who do it well. I, we're not going to probably as an industry revisit this combination in a thoughtful way externally from a marketing perspective for maybe another 10 years. But eventually and, and, people are going to start to think, oh, there's got to be a better way to do this because now we have, okay, index fund or ETFs, they won. Yay, they have most of the assets. And active to survive will be the active that actually can kick butt and actually can do what they say they're going to do. And they will look for additional marketing stories. And they may dig, dig deeper to say, hey, we're more than just small cap and value. Um, we, we have a whole bunch of factors. We'd like to talk about them thoughtfully. Here they are. I think the, fu- the future play. are beta behemoths and baby boutiques. Remember my bees, Be- uh, beta behemoths and baby boutiques. The baby boutiques are going to be all about adding value, and they will use any tools that will help them do that. Because if they do, they can charge a higher fee. They don't have to be about gathering AUM. So final comment, uh, the, the light at the end of the tunnel, which you just described, Michael, is our research shows that the highest fee managers actually perform better. And they actually earn back their fee. Um, anyway, um, we, well, we don't at- know the correlation of that is a little bit uh, questionable. Which they, comes first? I think it comes fee or the performance. I, I think the performance comes first, then the, the fees. But nonetheless, if you use fees as a way of screening out, you've just screened out most of the like the managers most likely outperform. That's a whole nother conversation. Yes, anyway, we are at the end of our time. Thank you so much for joining us. Our next uh, podcast, which will be the first of our second year, it's going to be episode 24. It's in two weeks' time. It will be the 24th of June, I think. 24th, is that right? Same time. It's always on Thursday. 14 days after 10 is 24. Yeah, I lost track of what today's date was for a moment. So it's going to be the 24th of June. It's always at noon Eastern or 11 if you live in Michael's time zone like Tom Brackey does. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you all for putting up with our benchmark dialogue. Thank Bye you, guys. Bye. The best Bye all. Today. Thank you. Mm-hmm.